Most of us have been raised with the idea it's better to be safe than sorry. That is not so. That is not so. That is a crock. It's not better to be safe than sorry. You may go after things and you might lose, and you might lose a lot of money, you might be embarrassed, but at least you give it a shot. I could tell you all kinds of stories that would spoil your week, or I lost, or it didn't work out. But there's more stories than how it did work out, because I wouldn't let that stop me. I just kept going. I kept going because I mixed with the right people, I read the right books, and I listened to the right recordings. Let's make up our mind, regardless of what you've been doing in the past, you're going to stretch. You're going to make some things happen in your life that are very big and very beautiful. Now, Robert Heinlein wrote this in a book, Strangers in a Strange Land. He was a science fiction writer back in the 60s. He said, in absence of clearly defined goals, we become strangely loyal to performing daily trivia until ultimately we become enslaved by it. Have you any idea the number of people that are just sitting playing, I don't know, some game on a computer? They're talking about nothing? Do you know that they're in the majority? They really are. I call it the chatter of the masses. If you happen to be caught up in that, make up your mind that that's going to stop right now. Joel Barker wrote a book around 1990. It was an incredible book. It's called Paradigm. Some of the things in it are just shocking that we read about what happened to people because of paradigms. He said, to be able to shape our future, we've got to be willing and able to change the paradigm. Now, are we able? We've got infinite potential. No one knows what we're capable of. There's nobody alive. The wisest among us can't even guess at what you are capable of doing. Do you know you've got more power in your hand, potential power, than is required to light up this whole hotel for about a week. There's around 11 million kilowatt hours per pound potential energy locked up in the electrons and the atoms of your body. No one can guess at what we're capable of doing. And most people, well, if I try it, what if it doesn't work? You'll find out it doesn't work, but get out and do it. You're going to hear from Anders Hansen here. Stand up, just wave at the crowd, okay? Now, I'm going to introduce him to you. I met him three years ago, is it? Seems like last week. Three years ago, we were in the Bellagio Hotel in Vegas, and he'd come over. I was in the lobby, I think, and he'd come over and introduce himself, and he apologized for just barging on me like that. And he said, but I've been studying your material. He said, I would just love to talk to you for a minute. I said, I don't have a minute right now, but if you want, I'll meet you in the morning for breakfast. So the next morning we met. And he had an idea. I said, that's a great idea. I said, I'll help you do that. Well, you know there's all kinds of people who will help you with your idea. He's going to demonstrate. He's going to show you his idea. I'll figure out when we do it, and I'll tell you later. I'm not sure but he's built a company around this idea. And he said a few thousand people that are improved, they live in a better life because of it. He asked for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. You willingly give and graciously receive. I was just back at the table there talking to the streamers. We have a camera where we can communicate separately with them. And I was telling them, that's one of the secrets of success. You willingly give and graciously receive. You can't give too much. It's like putting money in the bank. In fact, it's better than that because you're dealing with a universal intelligence and it always comes across. You willingly give and graciously receive. Now that probably is not part of your paradigm because not many people have been raised with that idea. They begrudgingly give a little and try and get as much as they can back. Don't just willingly give and graciously receive. It's such a phenomenal law. So we've got to pick some of these things up and then ask yourself, do I do that just automatically? Is that a habitual part of my nature? If it's not, let's make it a part of our nature. Like I just finished town a few minutes ago. I've been at this for 59 years, but I am as fascinated with the accuracy of how this works today as I've always been. It's just mind boggling when I see how accurate this works. 
My mind is always on what we're doing, on our company, and where we're going, and how can we do it faster and better and bigger. And whenever I build an idea in my mind to move, I attract whatever I have to attract. That's how I attract Sandy Gallagher. Ooh, you know. Oh, really? Listen. She was a very successful attorney, a securities attorney. She was buying and selling banks. And I said, what? Yeah, I watched her one time. We were at Niagara Falls. I don't know what the hell we were doing over there. There was a bunch of us there anyway. And she said, I've got to go. And she's on the phone, I think in a little bit. I don't know. But she's on the phone. And she's on the phone, I think at a little coffee shop or something selling a bank. I said, what? Turning them public, merging them. Absolutely brilliant. But she doesn't do that anymore because she's doing this now. We attracted her. You will attract whatever you require. It will walk right into your life. But you've got to believe that. You've got to know whatever you need will be there. You just work at improving you, changing the paradigm. Now, I love the way Buckminster Fuller put it. He said, you never change things by fighting existing reality. And that's what most people do. Never trying to fight existing reality. He said, you don't change things that way. He said, to change something, you have to build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. When Sandy joined our company, she became my partner. She built a new model. It was a very successful model. And it's becoming more successful all the time. I don't know what you need. And odds are pretty good you don't know what you need to get to wherever you want to go. But things happen. Happened for you, didn't it? Absolutely phenomenal. Phenomenal. We are wired into the entire universe. Now that may be out of your thinking, but understand this. If I hit send and I took a picture, and I hit send, if I'm sending it to your number, it won't matter where you are. You'll get it simultaneously with me sending it. You could be in Kuching or Korkinabalu. And I hit send and bang like that, you've got it on your phone. And you're on the other side of the world. It'd take you 25 hours to get there, in the air. But it doesn't take 25 seconds for you to get it here. Why? Because we're dealing with frequencies. Everything is here. Everything you want is here. You've got to get on the frequency that you have to be on to get what you want to get. How do you get on that frequency? By seeing yourself already there. We're too physical. We are grounded. We're tied into the earth. And we've got to stop that. That's not a way to do it. We let the outside, we let the physical results control us. Understand the physical results are nothing but the manifestation of what's been going on in here in the past. We want to change that. You build a new model. I spent all day yesterday till late last night building a model. It's not complete yet. But I'm building a model. And I'm going to execute it. I'm going to execute it just as sure as it's dark tonight. And everything that's required will come. It'll come just whoop, here it comes. And it will for you. So don't fight existing reality. Build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. This is probably one of the most beautiful and truest statements you'll ever see. It's not who you are that holds you back. It's who you think you're not. If you haven't seen that before, write it down. Burn it into your mind. It's not who you are. It's who you think you're not. Instead of saying, well, I couldn't do that. Start to see yourself as a person who can do it with ease. Money is a great yardstick because you can measure it right to the penny. You can't measure happiness. You can't measure health. You go to a doctor and they give you a clean bill of health. Walk out and drop over. You can't measure that. But money you can measure right to the penny. Now, I'm not suggesting you let money control you. You want to control it. But it's a good way to measure are you moving ahead if you're in a profit-making business. You want to see how fast you can earn this, how fast you can earn that. Then have something very constructive to do with it. Because money is a servant. It serves us. Self-confidence is the first requisite to great understanding or undertaking. 
There's a marvelous essay that Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote on self-reliance. His essay on self-reliance. It's absolutely incredible. In that essay, he said something. He said, we'll all hit a point in our unfoldment when we'll realize that envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide. Now think of that. There will come a time in everybody's unfoldment when they'll realize that envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide. To envy someone else is to say, I believe you got something going for you that I haven't got going for me and I'm going to envy you. If they've done it, that's positive proof you can do it. If one person in town can get wealthy, everybody in town can get wealthy. Wallace D. Waddles wrote that in The Science of Getting Rich. The Science of Getting Rich was the foundation of the movie The Secret. We're going to be teaching The Science of Getting Rich in Dallas in March. I believe it is. It's a phenomenal program. There'll come a time in everybody's unfoldment when they'll realize envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide. You can't be like anybody else. Nobody can be like you. You are unique. There's nothing in the whole universe that's like you. You are a unique part of the whole scheme of things. There's a beautiful poem that I put in two different places in the Born Rich book that said the one and only you. I want you to listen to that, but don't just hear my voice. I'm going to talk about you. I want you to think about you. Every single blade of grass and every flake of snow is just a wee bit different. There's no two alike, you know. From something small like grains of sand to each gigantic star, each one was made with this in mind to be just what they are. How foolish can they imitate? And how useless to pretend when each one of us comes from a mind whose ideas never end. There'll only be just one of me to show what I can do. And likewise, you should be really proud that there's only one of you. You see, I think one of the big problems we have when we're little kids, we say, Mommy, Daddy, whatever I want. And they may be busy, they probably are. And we're interrupting them and they'll say, Well, how the hell are you going to do that? Where do you think the money's going to come from? We're just little kids. I mean, we don't know how to solve that kind of stuff. How are you going to do that? The kid doesn't know. And because they get those answers all the time, pretty soon they get the idea they can't do it. It would be nice, but they can't do it. Wouldn't it be different if we just took a moment and say, well, of course you can have it. You can have it if you want it. Let's sit down and think about it. We've got an imagination. It's a higher faculty. None of the other animal lives have it. We're the only creature on the planet that has the imagination. We've got some other tools, too, that nobody else has, just us. Why don't you start seeing yourself with it? Now, see, some parents would think, well, God, you start teaching a kid to do that, you're really going to have a problem with them. No, you're not. There's some kids raised that way. They want to create great things because at a very early age, they learn they can do anything. I had an associate over in Kuala Lumpur that I worked with for quite a while. He had a little boy, four years old. The kid could speak four languages. They thought nothing of it. Glenn Doman, who's gone now, I believe, but he wrote a marvelous book, How to Multiply Your Child's Intelligence. He was teaching kids to read before they could talk. And when they could talk, you'd give them a book and a CAT scan, and they'd read it to you. We have no idea what we're dealing with when we're dealing with our mind and our potential. We've got to get rid of this idea we can't do anything. You can do anything you want, anything you can think of. And we're going to find that our confidence comes with knowledge. The more we learn, the more confident we become. You'll hear people say they don't have any confidence. That's not true. They do have confidence, maybe not in a particular area. They're confident they can drive their car. They're confident they can get dressed. They're confident they can put their makeup on or shave. So to say they don't have any confidence, it's not an accurate statement. Well, how do we become confident? By gathering more information. I'll tell you something else. If you don't keep gathering information, your confidence will start to wane. You'll start to lose it. You've got to keep gathering information. You want your confidence to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And if you don't keep studying, your confidence will start to slip. 
Like with the knowledge I've got, I could coast to the end of my life, earning all kinds of money and having a pretty good time. But I know I won't go beyond where I'm at, and I'll start slipping back. You've got to keep studying. I got up at 3 o'clock this morning, but I went to bed fairly early too, and I was studying for a couple of hours. I get up early in the morning and I study every morning because I want to get better at what I'm doing. And I know I can get better. I know that I'm nowhere near as effective as I can be. We've got to get this right in our mind. This idea of lack of confidence, it's something that anybody can change. I remember when I first started to study this. We're so afraid of what other people might think of us. It's so silly. I only went to high school, as I said, for two months. There was so much vocabulary that you could stick in a thimble. There was not much to it. And if you were talking, you said something and you used a word I didn't understand. I would never say I don't understand what you're saying. But I didn't understand. I was lost in the conversation really fast. But I was afraid to say I don't understand that word. I started to study Earl's material. And Earl talked about how important vocabulary is. In fact, he made a recording on it. And I started to study words. Now, if you use a word that I don't understand, I'll say, wait a minute, stop it. I don't understand what that word means. I'll ask you right there. Because I know if I don't get that cleared up, everything you say from there on odds are pretty good. I'm not going to understand it. You get lost in the conversation. Why wouldn't I tell you I didn't understand? Because I was afraid of what you thought of me. You've got to quit worrying about what other people think about you. If you knew how little they did think about you, you wouldn't be so concerned what they are thinking. Terry Whitaker wrote a book, the title of it, What You Think of Me Is None of My Business, and it isn't. What other people think of you is none of your business. Quit worrying about what they think. I hope you like me, but if you don't, you've got a problem. Because I like me. I don't give a damn whether you like me or not. I really don't. I hope you do and you should. I'm a nice guy. But if you don't, you're not going to bother me. Now for many years, that would have driven me crazy. Not anymore, not a bit. This confidence concept is pretty big. And the more you study this material that we're giving you, the more confident you're going to become. Now there's two things you have to know if you want to create wealth. And I'm not going to give you a brain hernia. This is really simple stuff. One, you've got to know where you are. Two, you've got to know where you're going and then you've got to get moving. This is where I am. That's where I'm going. You can know where you're going if you don't know where you're at. It won't do you any good. You jump out of a plane and shoot safely to Earth. It's overcast, you can't see the stars. You know you're on the North American continent, that's all you know. You don't know where you are. Your objective is to get to Nacogdoches, Texas. What way are you going to start walking? You wouldn't know. You could be in Atlanta and start to head towards Philadelphia. You could be in Seattle and start towards Vancouver. You see, you can know where you're going if you're not honest to yourself where you're at. You're wasting your time. You've got to know where you're at. And you've got to know where you're going and then you've got to get moving in that direction. It is so simple and so obvious you have to ask yourself why. Why are so many people stuck? And I'm going to tell you there's a lot of people stuck. Well, for a long time I would have said there's what's missing. Don't have a goal. You've got to have a goal. I've had a goal. I've had it on a card for many, many years ever since I started to think real rich. You've got to have a goal. But you know, I've changed my attitude. I'm pretty articulate about my goal. I've got it written out and I've got a clear picture of it. You might not have done that, but I think we can say there's something you want. You've never written it out. You've not really been very articulate about it, but there is something you want. So we can say that would constitute the goal. That's not the problem. That is not the problem. Here's the problem right here. It's where you're at. Most people really don't know. Do you know what you do? Do you know why you do it? Do you know how you do it? 
Do you know how often you do it? Can you see where this is really controlling your life? This is really important. There's the problem. There's the problem right there. The paradigm. Because if you want something more than you've got, you've got to give more than you're giving. You've got to do more than you're doing. And you start doing that you'll move ahead like a rocket. No one knows what you're capable of doing. There isn't one soul alive that knows what you're capable of doing, and that includes you. We're dealing with infinite potential. We've got power within us that you know it goes beyond the scope of our imagination. I was talking about the chicken soul for the soup books Mark has just put out a new book with his wife Crystal, and it's called Ask. That's it. Ask. That's the name of the book. And it's the bridge that'll take you from where you are to your destiny. Now that book will probably sell a few million copies. Ask. That's what most people don't do. They don't ask. They don't ask for enough. When you take a look and think all I have to know is where I am and where I'm going and then realize that very few people have this down. Very few people. Maybe five people out of 100. 95 out of 100 have just figured out. The paradigm is controlling them. Literally controlling them. It's not the opportunity. The opportunity is there. Now this is a black and white deal. There's no gray matter here. It doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter how many hours you put in. If the paradigm does not change, ultimately the results will remain much the same one year from the next. The end of December, there's all kinds of people looking at the results and it's almost identical to the previous year. I have sat in many executive offices because I've sold a zillion corporations in my life and I'd sit down with the VP of sales and I'd say, give me the names of two people, first names, that you're familiar with in your company. Maybe Betty and Harry. He knew that their last names were. I said, do you know? He would ask me, what are you going to do to help us? I said, you know what those people are going to be doing in July of this year. You can go into memory and you can predict where they're going to be in July or in October. Here we are. It's in January. But you know what those people, where they're going to be, where their sales will be a few months from now. He said, what do you mean? I said, their sales aren't going to change very much. You go into memory in your computer and you build a tummy and you know damn well you can do that. He said, that's true. I said, when you go to set goals for the year, what you do is you look at your history and you let the history dictate then what the increase is going to be, say maybe five to 10% increase. I said, why would you do that? I said, do you have any idea what the hell you're doing? Not many people would call on a VP of a big company and level with them like that. You know why? They're not confident enough, but I am because I know what I'm talking about. Now, if you took me into an engineering office and they're talking about the engineering, I said, I don't know my ass on page nine when I get in there. That's the way a person should stick to their knitting and get better at it all the time. I've done that for 60 years but you know and I know that we let our history dictate where we're going. That's a dumb game. That doesn't make any sense at all. Why the hell would we do that? It's our paradigm. We've been always doing that. Do you agree here? Do you have a paradigm problem? Yes, yeah, so do I. That's what we've got in common. You know the good thing. We're both smart enough to recognize that. When we don't recognize it, we're toast and just, you're going to lose. It's a black and white deal. You can say, well, there's all kinds of factors that come into play. No, there isn't. This is it. This is it. When I talked to Phil, I said, Phil, he said, can you help me? And I said, yes, I can. It probably blew your mind how I could help you. But I said, you've got to do exactly what I tell you. And if you don't, I'll fire you. I won't help you. If I coach somebody one-on-one, -on -one, it costs them a lot of money. And if they don't do what I tell them, I fire them. I won't help them. And I don't give them a refund. And I tell them that right at the start. We're not playing a game. I've only got so much time. I don't get any more time than you. I get all there is. Yet when it's gone, it's gone. 
this is my life that I'm dealing with. I have no intentions of screwing around with my time. I charge a lot of money to do what I do. And I'm very effective. I'm not very effective at anything else. I'm not permitted to do anything around the house because I screw it up every time. And I don't mind admitting it. I just sit there and let somebody else do it. I remember when I started that, we had a guy, Frank, that cleaned the pool. It used to bother me. I would sit there and I'd watch Frank. I thought I should be helping him. And Joe cut the lawn. Joe's been cutting our lawn ever since we moved into that house. It was 35 years ago. And it used to bother me because I should be helping him because I'm just sitting there reading under an umbrella. It was a hot day. He's cutting the lawn, cleaning. It doesn't bother me a bit anymore. I was coaching a guy that had more money than God. And he had a place at Cap Antibes in France, in the south of France. He had another one in Gestat. He had a beautiful place in Eaton Square in London. If I had taken him to his place in London, you would have thought it was Prince Charles' place. This guy had lots of money. He had a yacht, 120-foot yacht, that he used to ship from the Mediterranean to the Caribbean. Shipping on a ship on Dock Express. He said, well, it's faster than sailing it, or cheaper, or something like that. And I used to sit and talk to him. Paid me a lot of money. And I remember one time we were in Cap Antipes. He had a beautiful place. It was right across the bay from Cannes. And in the morning, there was a picnic table out in the yard. I was out there, and they brought in some fresh scones from, were in the south of France. I mean, you get the best there. And we're sitting there eating, and some jam and some tea. And I was finished. I picked up I was going to take their cups, and I didn't say, you don't do that. He took a little bell and rang it, and people would come out to take it. He said, if you do that, they would be out of work. I started to think about this, and I thought, you know you have to learn to be served. You do. You have to learn to be served. I learned it. I love it. It's true. Hashem taught me that. You've got to learn to be served. You see, that's the way he was raised. That's the way he was raised. I wasn't raised that way. You get it, or you don't get it. You don't get it, or you clean up. I wasn't raised that way. I had to learn it. But I got to the point where it didn't bother me at all to watch Joe cut the lawn or Frank clean the pool. A couple of ladies worked the house. It doesn't bother me at all. They'll serve me, they'll make me something to eat and bring it for me, because that's what they get paid to do. You'll have to learn almost everything if you want to really change the quality of your life. You've got to realize that we're being controlled right now. You are controlled. I'm controlled by a paradigm. You say, well, how did we get it? Well, stop and think of where you came from. Little particle of energy from mom and a little bit from dad come along, and they were in harmony. They were in harmony. They were in harmonious vibration. They became one and that was you. And then for 280 days, they kept attracting more particles of energy. All mom's habits, all dad's habits are in that little bit of energy. It's hard to believe that you could put a million bits of information on the head of a pin, but we can actually do that now and are doing it. Why do you think you look so much like your relatives? Do you think it's an accident? When I was young, I had red hair. Now I've got a mother. She didn't have red hair. I had a father. He didn't have red hair. I have a sister and a brother. They didn't have red hair. You'd be thinking, HM. That could lead to all kinds of speculation, couldn't it? But my mother's father and all his brothers had red hair. So you see, it jumps one generation into another. You look like your relatives. You see, I could tell you more about Farah. I don't think I've ever met you but I could tell you all kinds of things about yourself. She operates predominantly from the right hemisphere of her brain. Very creative, very high energy, and a hard time staying behind a desk. 
you better earn a lot of money because you could spend it really fast. You say, well, how do you know that? I just know that. I know exactly what she's like. She's a lover. She's got high energy, very creative. Nobody has to tell me. I know it. You know something. Everything around her tells me that. See this physical thing she's living in? That's the body that Farah's living in. You never see Farah. You just see her body. You see the expression of Farah, but you don't see her. And that body vibrates. And it's vibrating so fast it appears to be still. And it glows. Yet there's energy coming. And you know you've got a mental faculty that can pick that up. And you can read it just like a book. It is like a book. Did you know you had the faculty to do that? You're not sure. Well, I'm not in touch with it, but yes, I do know. You're not in touch with it. Yeah, yes, you are in touch with it. You haven't learned to use it then. You see, I'm not doing this to embarrass you. I'm doing this to show everybody that you've got that. You see, we have mental faculties. You know, we're the only creature on the planet that's totally disoriented in our environment. All the other little creatures on the planet are completely at home in their environment. We're not. They blend in. We're totally disoriented. You know why? We've been given the mental faculties to create our own environment. That's kind of nice, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, that's what we can do. You see, that's your intuition that you're reading people with. You have intuition, perception, will reason, imagination, and memory. They're all higher faculties. These are the most phenomenal tools. They're what make us who we are. You'd think we'd be taught in school that we have these and then how to use them. But the teachers don't even know it. You know, just as I was looking past there, I looked at you. You've got an interesting personality. Yeah, you confuse the hell out of yourself at times. There's a part of you that is just so persistent, stubborn, like a bull. And there's another part of you that's wishy-washy and sensitive to your feelings. You get hurt just like that. And you have a tendency to hold it inside. There's a part of you that do this, and there's another part saying, no, don't do it. Don't do it. So you've got a lot of that going on. Do it. Don't do it. You are almost an even balance between right and left hemisphere of your brain. Fair is mostly right brain. You operate from both hemispheres of the brain almost equal. One side's very analytical. The other side's very emotional and sensitive. How would I know that? Because it's obvious. I know she's a woman. You'll say, Bob, that's brilliant. How did you figure that out? M.M. Hanch. Emmer May knows that. Everybody knows that. Everybody does not know that she's a woman. A baby doesn't know she's a woman. A baby has to develop the awareness of the difference in gender. If they haven't got the awareness of babies looking for a nipple. But if daddy puts a thumb there, the baby will start sucking on that thumb. Why? Lack of awareness. As the baby develops the awareness, life starts to change. But we've got to become aware that we have these higher faculties. And if you really want to change your paradigm, you've got to shift your thinking.